This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hey, cat lovers. Welcome to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. I'm your host, Dr. Catherine Prim, and I'm a small animal veterinarian and cat lover. So the goal of this show, in my mind, is to educate cat owners and help them be the best cat lover that they can be, the best equipped person to take care of their cats in the best possible way. So today, I've invited Dr. Justine Lee, who is an emergency veterinarian as well as a toxicologist, to help me guide you in how to put together a DIY first aid kit for your cat. So we'll be right back after this message to talk with Dr. Lee a little bit about how to go about doing this. We'll be right back. You know what I love? I love my cat. My cat Scamper has discriminating taste. He doesn't like just anybody. So when he acts like he loves me, it makes me feel good. Like like somehow I made the cut. But you know what I don't love? Cleaning up Scamper's litter box. Which is why Arm & Hammer created new cloud control litter. There's no cloud of nasties when I scoop. It's 100% dust free, free from heavy perfumes, and it helps reduce airborne dander when I scoop. So, what happens in the litter stays in the litter. New Cloud Control Cat Litter by Arm & Hammer. More power to ya. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat on Pet Life Radio. As I mentioned, I have Dr. Justine Lee. Hi, Dr. Lee. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the show today. I'm really excited because this is something I've really wanted to do for a long time, and, and I'm thrilled that you're willing to, to be a part of it. So I want to sort of give some background about what you do and, and what you see and, and why you might have an opinion on this issue. Sure. So I will say as an emergency critical care specialist and a toxicologist, I am so passionate about educating cat owners about the dangers around Easter lily time. And the biggest danger that I worry about are Easter lilies. My own sister's cat that I actually gave her died of what we call aneuric kidney failure after getting into Easter lilies. And so really important to let owners know about that. So is there anything that you specifically would want people to know other than make sure you don't have Easter lilies around your cat? Maybe something that they could watch for or understand more about the dangers of Easter lilies? Sure. So the first thing to remember is a lot of plants are oftentimes called lily and not all lilies are poisonous. So you want to actually confirm whether or not it's a poisonous type of lily or not. Now, the two biggest types that I worry about the most are what we call true lilies or lilium or hemorrhagalis species. And these come in all different types. So it could be Easter lilies that you bring home from church. They're usually white with a beautiful bloom and pet owners have to be able to recognize that. But don't forget about the Asiatic lily, the Japanese show lily, the oriental lily, even some species of day lily, the tiger lily, the wood lily, the red lily. So a ton of different dangerous types. It only takes two or three leaves or even the water in the vase or the pollen to result in severe kidney failure in cats. And a lot of pet owners don't know about it. So I always say before you even think about bringing any fresh cut flower or any bouquet from a florist into your house, you always want to check with your vet your ER vet, or the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center to make sure it's a safe plant for your cat. So I love the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center because they have a great website and they have pictures and it is a really, really good thing. They also have a phone number that I wanted my cat lovers to be sure and be aware of. It is 888-426-4444. Three, five, and we'll try to include that number in the write-up associated with the show. So are there any other things that you might want to cover? I want to get back to the do-it-yourself first aid kit, but, but this is so important because it is so life-threatening. Is there anything else that my cat-loving listeners need to know about houseplants specifically? 
So not only are Easter lilies an issue, but during this time of the year, a lot of people are doing spring planting of spring bulbs. So they may have spring bulbs or even fertilizer products around the house. Now, thankfully, cats have such a discriminating palate. In other words, they're not gorgers. They don't eat a ton of a product the way a dog would. But I always say, if you're about to garden, you're about to mulch, you're about to compost, please keep all that stuff out of your cat's reach. The bigger danger that I see during Easter time include things like Easter grass. Now, this isn't real grass. This is the fake stuff, the plastic strands of Easter grass that you put in your child's Easter basket. And most people think, ah, it's plastic. It's not going to be a big deal. When in actuality, I've seen cats that develop something called the linear foreign body, which is a really, really dangerous type of obstruction. In other words, cats are so curious, they're going to eat that Easter grass. And unfortunately, when they swallow it, it's so long and ropey that that string wraps around their tongue or even gets stuck in the end of their stomach and it saws through their intestine. So keep Easter grass, Easter lilies, gardening products out of reach this time of the year. I actually have treated a cat with Easter grass as well. So I'm glad that you brought that up. We don't think of it as a dangerous thing, although I think about how much it irritates me to pick it up all over the floor for months. But yes, that is certainly something we want everyone to be aware of. So along the line of springtime hazards, there are other things that sort of seem to happen in the spring that you may have seen coming in the door of your ER. During this time of the year, I do worry about spring cleaning. And that's because people are motivated to open their windows and clean their bathrooms, clean their garage. And what they don't realize is cats have an altered liver metabolism. So their liver can't metabolize certain chemicals as well as dogs can. For that reason, there are some products around the house that are totally safe for dogs, but even a few licks are really dangerous to cats. So I always say, if you're going to spring clean this time of the year, please do so, but keep your cat secured in one room. In other words, lock them in the bathroom or lock them in the bedroom with their own kitty litter, their own water and their own food while you clean the rest of the house. That's because even something that seems benign, like liquid laundry detergent, after all, we stick our hand in it when we're washing our clothes, even a few licks of it can result in corrosive burns in a cat. Again, totally safe to you and your dog, but because of that altered liver problem in cats can definitely be corrosive and result in burns and other medical problems. Well, and I think that a lot of people think that if a product says that it's natural, that it means that it's safe. And your point is well taken. It doesn't mean that it's safe for cats. So read your labels and just keep your cats away from these things when you're cleaning and safe. Well, one of the emergencies that I hate seeing through the ER vet is something called high-rise syndrome. And thankfully, I hardly see this anymore. But when I used to live in Boston and Philly, I would see cats that fall out of the windows of really high apartment complexes. And this completely freaks out pet owners. It can be really deadly to your cat. And so I always say if you're spring cleaning or you're trying to open up the windows to allow some fresh air to come in, please make sure that your cat cannot fall out the window. You have to make sure that those screens are well secured or you use screen protectors or you open it from the very top of the windows and just crack it open because I've seen way too many cats accidentally fall out. The interesting thing about something called high rise syndrome is that cats actually are able to reach terminal velocity which means that depending on the height that they fall from, it may be more dangerous than other heights. In other words, if your cat falls from the 20th floor versus the third floor, it's actually the third floor that's the most dangerous. And that's because if your cat falls from a really high apartment complex, they're able to spread out their legs and reach terminal velocity and slow down a little bit. So the biggest danger is actually falling five stories or less. Regardless, it's so scary for cat owners. So please make sure you're not keeping those windows open or that you have a really, really good screen protector to keep your cats safe. Unfortunately, when we do see high-rise syndrome in cats, I typically will see really bad trauma to the jaw and the chest. In other words, cats will hit the cement and they'll fracture their jaw or their mandible and crack it right in the middle. They can get lung tears. They can get internal bleeding. They can get rib fractures. They can fracture their legs. So we always want to make sure to keep our cats safe by, again, 
keeping those poisonous plants out of reach, like those Easter lilies, keeping certain seasonal poisons like Easter grass out of the way. If you're spring cleaning, making sure to keep those household chemicals out of reach, making sure those household cleaners dry appropriately, and that you're keeping your cat safe in your open windows. So that kind of brings me to the portion that I was very excited about talking to you about of what can we put together at our home to kind of have a first aid kit? Since most of us don't live right next door to a veterinarian, what are some things that my listeners could learn about maybe assessing a pet with an injury or a suspected ingestion of a toxin and kind of deciding how to triage that and then have what items might they need to keep things kind of calm down until they can get to the vet? That is such a great question, Dr. Kat. I will say cats are really hard to be able to pick up on medical problems because they are so stoic. In other words, just like the big cats that they've evolved from, they don't show their signs until it's really, really severe. They don't want someone taking over the pride. So again, they're going to mask their signs. So I always tell people the best thing you can do is pick up on signs as early as possible. If you even think that your cat is hiding or they're drinking a little bit more than usual or the clumps in the litter box are bigger than the fist of your hand, you want to seek veterinary attention sooner than later versus ending up in the emergency room. I always tell people when it comes to poisoning with cats, there is nothing safe that you can give at home as a cat owner to induce vomiting. You have to get to the veterinarian. Now, trust me, as an emergency critical care specialist and toxicologist, I see a lot of erroneous, wrong advice on the internet. You do not give hydrogen peroxide or anything else to your cat. You go straight to the vet or the ER vet if your cat ate something poisonous. And more importantly, realize that with any poisoning or any medical problem, the sooner you recognize a problem, the sooner we vets can treat it, and the better the prognosis. And to be quite honest, it's going to be less expensive for you if you bring in your cat sooner versus later. For example, with Easter lilies, we know that if your cat ate a few leaves, it will cause kidney failure in typically 24 to 36 hours. But if you bring them in immediately, sometimes we have time to pump the stomach and give charcoal to bind up the poison. We'll still need to keep your cat on IV fluids for 24 to 48 hours, but the prognosis is much, much better. And it'll be way less expensive than treating your cat once you're ready in kidney failure, which could cost five to $8,000. So when in doubt, pet proof your house, cat proof it, make sure you're not bringing in any poisonous plants. And if you do think that your cat may have eaten something poisonous, please again, call your veterinarian your emergency veterinarian, or the ASPC Animal Poison Control Center for life-saving advice. I should disclose there is a small fee for calling, but that may help you determine whether or not your cat even needs to go into the vet or the ER vet. And it also provides advice for your vet on how to treat that case. So I think the first important components of a first aid kit for your cat, what you're saying is your vet's phone number and the ASPCA emergency poison, animal poison control phone number. So those are great things to put in your first aid kit. I totally agree. I'm neurotic about my own pets and I actually pre-program my cell phone and my GPS in my car. So if something happens and someone needs to go to the local vet or the emergency doctor or call right away, we have all that information already pre-programmed in there. You bring up a great point about first aid kits. There are a lot of great first aid kits out there for humans, but there are a couple of unique things that cat owners need to have in their cat first aid kit. Well, I think that there are things that can happen to cats that maybe aren't a dire emergency where you got to whip out that GPS and you might debate, what should I do? Things like wounds and injuries and things. So are there things in the first aid kit that you could at least pull out to sort of stabilize until you could get to the veterinarian? Absolutely. So the first thing that I recommend for a first aid kit just in case there are some things you can do at home is again, get a copy of your cat's medical record. Make sure the phone number is printed out for your vet, emergency vet, and the ASPCA. Print out directions, and then make sure to buy a standard human first aid kit. That oftentimes has a lot of the things that we need. It's going to have bandages. It's going to have some gauze. It might have some tweezers. It might have gloves in there. But a couple other things that I want you to add in include getting certain types of bandage material or things like vet wrap. You can always purchase this from your veterinarian. 
And we want to make sure it's clean or sterile because if your cat has a really bad wound, sometimes being able to put a light bandage on as you seek veterinary attention will help keep it clean. The other important thing is to have non-latex gloves in there, a pen light, and a thermometer. Now, I don't recommend using a mercury thermometer. I recommend using something like a kid's digital thermometer along with some sterile lubrication packets. Most of the time, I don't want cat owners taking their cat's temperature at home because the only true accurate way is rectally. And so it's oftentimes safer for us as veterinary professionals to do it. But it is good to have in case of an emergency. The other thing that I like to have is I like to have a pillowcase if an event that you need to grab your cat and go immediately. This is especially important during natural disasters. So say there's a hurricane or something and you need to evacuate immediately and you can't find your cat carrier. This is a great emergency way of being able to secure your cat. Making sure that you have a blanket in there or a towel to help wrap your cat in case of emergency. I also like to have a what we call an Elizabethan collar or an e-collar just in case your cat has an injury and you need to protect it by using an e-collar. Now you're probably thinking, when do I need to put an e-collar on my cat? Well, if your cat gets something bad in its eye that could be really dangerous, like something corrosive, we don't want your cat scratching at the eye. So an e-collar would be the perfect time to put it on. The last few things that I would add into a pet first aid kit, specifically for cats, include a can of tuna in water. You also want to make sure you have a can opener so you can open that. That's because if cats eat something that's bitter or makes them drool a lot or can cause ulcers in their mouth or burns in their esophagus, I want you to give something tasty like that canned tuna water, which will help wash the poison out of the mouth and out of the esophagus. The next thing that I want you to have in a cat-specific first aid kit is a small travel size container of Dawn for cleaning dishes in a sink. So something like a liquid dish soap. If you accidentally get a chemical or even a dog flea and tick medication that's poisonous to cats on their skin, I want you to be able to bathe it off. And you want to be able to bathe it with a liquid dish soap like Dawn that's very, very gentle. The last few things I would include in your cat first aid kit include an up-to-date copy of your cat's rabies certificate along with some type of collar and a recent picture just in case you're separated from your cat and you can ID it, which brings up another point of why it's so important to get your cat microchipped just in case of emergency. I also want you to have scissors, tweezers, and a new container of sterile eye flush. You're probably thinking, oh, I'm never going to use that. But again, if your cat gets something corrosive in the eye, I want you to be able to have the ability to flush out your cat's eye in case of emergency. What should you not have? I don't want you to have any over-the-counter medications. Remember, one Tylenol, which contains acetaminophen, can kill your cat. So you should never, ever, ever give any type of medications to your cat without checking with your veterinarian or the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center first. The other thing is triple antibiotic. Triple antibiotic ointment typically comes in a human first aid kit. And to be quite honest, we rarely ever want you to use this in cats because rarely cats can have an anaphylactic reaction that can be deadly to triple antibiotic ointment. There's other ointments that we can use in cases of emergency, but I do not want you to use triple antibiotic in your cat. Well, let's take a quick break and get a word from our sponsors and come back and sort of wrap it up because you've given us a ton of really great information. So we'll be right back after these messages. Molly, here's your dinner. (laughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. (laughs) 
Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Kat on Pet Life Radio. And we're talking with Dr. Justine Lee about what you need to have in your at home first aid kit for your cat. So you were just discussing maybe some things we don't want to have. So I'd like to continue with that. I mean, how many times have you had a cat come in where the owner said, well, I put a little um, antibiotic cream on it and I hear it every day. So that is an important thing. Is there anything else? That's a great point, Dr. Kat. I will say that one of the biggest dangers that I see is when well-intentioned cat owners will use products that they don't know if it's dangerous or not and use it on their cat. So I already mentioned before inducing vomiting. We can safely induce vomiting at home with dog owners, but again, never with cats. The second thing is human over-the-counter medications we never want to give to our cats. So drugs like ibuprofen, or Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, or naproxen, which is often called Aleve, we never want to use. Using another cat's or another family member's medication also is a big no-no. For example, I oftentimes will see cat owners use an old cat's ointment for their eye. And just so you know, that can actually make your cat's eye worse. If your cat has an upper respiratory infection and has ulcers on the eye, we oftentimes will treat with a teramycin or erythromycin eye ointment, but we don't want to just randomly reach for an old tube of eye ointment that may be old and expired. And the main reason why is because if your cat has an ulcer on the cornea, the surface of the eye, if you've used the wrong tube and it contains a steroid, it will actually make your cat's ulcers worse. Same exact thing with over-the-counter household products. I've had some pet owners who will bring in their cat and say, oh, I sprayed this roach and ant spray on my cat because I saw fleas in the house. That's really poisonous to a cat. And again, it can contain chemicals that can be really dangerous. So when in doubt, please never use any of these medications. And keep in mind, there's some erroneous information on the internet. So you always want to check with your veterinarian or your ER vet before you apply any of these products. Okay, so that's my pet peeve, haha, that that people apply old medications or medications prescribed for another pet or even another species that I hate and it's really a bad idea. So all my listeners out there, throw away all of your old medications and never ever use them in an inappropriate way. Well, I'd like to thank all of you guys for listening to us today and especially Dr. Justine Lee for sharing her knowledge about emergency situations and do-it-yourself first aid kits. And as always, I want to thank our amazing producer, Mark Winter. And I want all my cat lovers to go out and have a perfect day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.